Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> All right, welcome to a session where you're going to hear what no one else is saying in healthcare today. My name is Rima Cohen. I'm the Managing Director of the Health Innovators Fellowship. That is a relatively new program that the Aspen Institute launched in partnership with the Greenville Health System, which is the largest nonprofit healthcare system in South Carolina. You're gonna be hearing this morning from four fellows from our inaugural class of the Health Innovators Fellowship. Um, every year in the fellowship, we get hundreds and hundreds of nominations of wonderful, amazing people, and we pick 20 each year. And the 20 that we pick are visionary, uh, bold entrepreneurs, innovators across the healthcare ecosystem. We have individuals in medicine, mental health, veterans care, policy making, biotech, and so forth. These individuals um, all have one thing in common. They are committed to going through a personal journey of self-reflection, looking at their inside at their own values, at their own leadership, and they make a commitment to themselves, to the fellows, to each other, that they are going to make an even broader and deeper impact on their area of healthcare. And as they identify challenges in our healthcare system and devise innovative solutions uh, to address them. We asked them this morning to think about what healthcare is right now and what it could be. And these leaders are gonna take you through their own journey. So you'll hear four compelling presentations and then I'm gonna invite the audience to uh, question, uh, question our uh, presenters, provide feedback, comments, you can challenge their assumptions. Um, we're gonna start this morning with Shannon Jacquard. She is the CEO of NAMI San Diego and she's a founder of a new company called Ballast Health. Uh, we have Patrick Hines who's going next. He is a pediatric critical care physician and he is the CEO of a company called Functional Fluidics, a medical diagnostics company. We have Rebecca Oni here who is the co-founder and visionary uh, and CEO of the nonprofit organization Health Leads in Boston. And we have Daniel Kraft who, among other things, and there are many, many other things, is the faculty chair of Singularity, uh, faculty chair of medicine at Singularity University. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Shannon. Oh. Okay. He's going to jump across. All right. <clears throat> So I would like everyone to take a moment to look at the person sitting next to you or nearby and find a label on their piece of clothing. It could be on sunglasses, a purse, a jacket. Can you um, shout it out? Marmot. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, so thank you. <laughs> So now think about that process of a stranger kind of looking into your personal space, slightly invasive maybe. Now what if you were given a label that could ultimately kill you? Would you want to keep playing the game? My name is Shannon Jacquard. I'm the CEO of the National Alliance on Mental Illness in San Diego and the co-founder of Ballast Health. And my brother Jeffrey, he was a six foot tall, avid skateboarder, class clown, was given one such label a label of schizophrenia, which did lead to him on the path that ultimately led to his death. So stigma is kind of one of those things, especially around mental illness, that we kind of see as a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, maybe we want people to just get over it, that it's not really a big deal. And yet suicide is a leading cause, or stigma is a leading cause of suicide in the United States. Right now, CNN has recently reported that the United States is at a 30-year high of suicidality. Also, stigma is the reason that there's a 10-year gap between the onset of symptoms and actually seeking out treatment or support. There was a research study that was conducted that compared the 1950s to today around stigma, and people today were asked, do you believe that mental illness is a true disorder or a sign of personal weakness? And today, people were saying it's a true disorder. But when they were asked, if their child can marry somebody with a mental illness, their coworker could have a mental illness, or their neighbor could have a mental illness, all of those values decreased from the 1950s. So in reality, what we're saying is, 
I believe you have a true disorder, that you did not cause it, that it is not a sign of personal weakness. However, you must maintain a 100-foot radius from me at all times. It really sounds like leprosy to me. And in fact, I've had people come up to me and say, it is more dignified to take your own life than to admit that you have a mental illness. And recently, about a month ago, an 18-year-old in San Diego, he did just that. He took his own life after being told that his bipolar disorder was morphing into the more stigmatized version of schizophrenia. So if stigma wasn't enough to kind of make you pause in seeking out treatment, the knowledge that people with mental illness tend to die 25 years younger than the average American would make you pause. The prevalence of metabolic syndrome has led to a two to three fold increase in cardiovascular disease. There was an amazing physician at Patton State Hospital once. He said, I want all of you in the audience to take 100 milligrams of Benadryl before you go to bed tonight and see what time you wake up in the morning. And the reason he did that was because a lot of these medications make people sleep like cats around 16 hours a day. So if you don't take your medicine, you're considered non-compliant. But if you do take your medicine, you're considered lazy. So either way, you really cannot win. So your self-esteem goes down, your self-worth goes down, your ability to recover goes down. And in fact, almost everyone that I know that has had to take an antipsychotic has gained between 50 and 100 pounds. And one of my staff members' husband, John, he did gain a significant amount of weight to the point where he was on oxygen. He was taking 16 different medications to deal with the side effects of each other. And about a couple months ago, his physician told him he had 18 months left to live if something didn't change. He was only 50 years old. So he opted for gastric bypass surgery in order to prolong his life. So medicine is an extremely important part of a mental health recovery, but we need to connect the mind and body in order to give longevity to people's lives who are dealing and struggling with a mental illness. We do not want them to be choosing between their brains and their bodies. So the US mental health system, as you may know, has really kind of failed. Uh, in many ways, you know, failure in and of itself is not the problem, but doing something over and over again and expecting a different outcome is. So inpatient hospitalization has really turned into a situation where it's a revolving door. A person goes in, then they feel like a failure. Uh, oftentimes, the experience can be traumatic for both the patient and the family members. So we need hospitalizations to be seen as a tool and not cruel. My success would be for somebody to voluntarily seek out an inpatient hospitalization when they need it. But what happens today due to stigma and other effects is that a person declines in their mental health. The family ends up calling the police. The police come to the home. They're handcuffed, put in the back of a cop car. They're taken to an inpatient hospitalization with the four-walled grade institution against their will. Now ask me, if, or I'm asking you, if a police officer handcuffed you, put you in the back of a cop car, do you think you're being taken to a place of healing? No. So people with mental illness don't either, which really breaks down the bonds of trust between the provider and the patient and the family. Once hospitalization is used as a form of punishment, it is no longer something you will seek out voluntarily. So no matter how yummy and great the gingerbread house will look like for Hansel and Gretel, they will always see it as a place that houses a witch. So we want to change that frame so that individuals want to seek out the form of hospitalization. Nowadays also, hospitalization is being seen or used as a threat to get another person to be compliant with the will of others, which again makes it a punishment. And when family members go and visit, they end up you know, with that one hour visitation, they leave those doors, they make a very loud clicking noise, and you immediately want to break down into tears. And there's no one there that's really to, to support you. But with one in five individuals having a mental illness and one in four families being caregivers of somebody with a mental illness, there is plenty of us who have the experience of being family members, caregivers for others, of being individuals who have been there and on our journey to recovery. So we can end the isolation, the shame, and the guilt by utilizing those of us with that personal experience. So um, my brother Jeff, he ended up in hospitalization. His last hospitalization was about four months long. I went to visit him, and the, the visitation person was looking through my purse. And she pulled out a pen and said to me, you don't know how dangerous these people can be. And here I am, a sister that's visiting somebody that she loves. The next day, my mother visited, and it was two minutes before the allotted cigarette break time. And uh, instead of working with him, it turned into a power struggle between my brother and the people who were supposed to be caring for him. 
And what they ended up doing was putting him in a five-point prone restraint after drugging him up with several medications. About 15 minutes later, he died of a heart attack at the age of 25 in a room tied to a bed by himself. And after we buried my brother, a man came up to my dad and said, well, you've struggled with him for so long. Aren't you glad it's over? So my brother, he lost his friends due to stigma. He was seen as less than human due to his schizophrenia, and he lost his life due, due to lack of healing. So my ultimate goal is that we all recognize our own self-stigma around mental illness, which is completely normal and human, but that we recognize it, that we employ more peers and family members to support others that are out there, that we combine the mind and body. So again, look at that person next to you and see them, though, without their labels. My goal is that all the Johns and Jeffreys in your life have the chance to recover and that we rip off the labels that can kill people. Thank you. Shannon, that was an excellent, very moving presentation. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, it's an honor to be here talking to you guys, and I'd like to thank Harima and the organizers of this event for giving the Health Innovator Fellows an, an opportunity and a platform to tell you about some issues that we find very important in, in healthcare. <clears throat> I'm going to take a much more personal approach and uh, tell you about a, um, an issue I see in healthcare and use a very specific example that relates to work that I do to sort of illustrate it. So um, I'm a, as Rima said, I'm a practicing pediatric ICU physician amongst other things. And um, the great thing about pediatric critical care is it gives me the opportunity to interact and get to know some of the most amazing and resilient people that you'd ever want to meet. Um, and I want to tell you about one in particular named Mary. Mary's a little girl from Detroit, uh, an avid Detroit Lions fan, which by definition makes her resilient. Um, <laughs> but she, she has a condition called sickle cell disease uh, that's caused by a single point mutation in a, in a hemoglobin molecule that uh, the, the, the chemical in your red blood cells that transports oxygen and releases it to the body when it needs to. Uh, with sickle hemoglobin, when it releases oxygen, these hemoglobin molecules can stick together and cause these uh, red blood cells to, to become misshapen and sickled and deform and sticky. And they can block small blood vessels and cause lots of problems with organs and tissues. When I met Mary, she had just had a, a significant bout of chest pain which made it difficult for her to breathe. Um, I remember it was a Tuesday night because I was on call, and I admitted her to the ICU. You never forget the look in a child's eyes when, despite their best, best efforts, they aren't able to breathe normally. And I had to put in a breathing tube, ventilate her until her, her lungs improved, and after multiple exchange blood transfusions, weaning her opiate medications to treat her pain, and getting her off oxygen, eventually Mary made a full recovery. And I never forget before I sent her away from the ICU, she gave me this big hug and whispered in my ear, thanks so much, doc. But no offense, I never want to see you here again. <laughs> <laughs> my entire clinical career is caring for very sick kids like Mary. And I love doing it, but I can't help but think that we could have done better by Mary if we had better preventable tools that, give, that would give us more insight uh, and ability to understand when these things are likely to happen. So when I think about tools, it takes me back to my PhD days, and I'm gonna get a little nerdy for a second, but I studied blood behavior uh, using simulated blood flow systems. So our premise was that to understand the way blood behaves in the body, you really need to create a system that simulates blood flow outside of the body. And taking this knowledge, we went back to the lab, and within a year, we had developed a clinical version of this blood flow assay that we were able to use in actual patients uh, with the goal of preventing the next kid like Mary from having a vaso-occlusive event. I found it functional fluidics to make this test more widely available, and uh, we used sickle cell as our first target indication for the test. So we began using this blood flow assay to, to identify individuals with sickle cell disease who are at risk for the most uh, dangerous complications, such as severe pain, acute chest like Mary presented with, and stroke. Um, but a second encounter with Mary made me totally rethink whether we were even asking the right questions about how we apply these types of tools. So I ran into Mary um, years later in the hospital during one of her outpatient uh, hematology visits. And um, she was a rising sophomore in high school, and by all accounts, she seemed like she was doing very well until she began telling me what her life was really like. 
So for Mary, every day she woke up, she was dealing with an extreme amount of fatigue and aching pain that her providers really didn't know much about. This affected her life. It affected her ability to be a normal teenager, interact with her friends. And she knew that at any moment, this fatigue and pain could escalate into a, an acute, debilitating, painful episode um, that could be a prelude to the stroke and the, and the um, acute chest syndrome and hospitalizations that would finally grab the attention of our healthcare providers. These are also the same clinical endpoints that we use in clinical trials of disease-modifying therapies. So this means that we're approving drugs that are only capable of treating the avalanche of endpoints and not the issues that Mary was pointing out. So imagine Mary's fatigue and her aches as snowballs at the top of a mountain in, in Aspen that can escalate rolling downhill and eventually become an avalanche, which was reflective of bigger problems like the pain crisis and the acute chest and the stroke and the hospitalizations. Yes, I know the snowballs don't cause avalanches, but you get my point. Clinicians and investigators and pharmaceutical companies really don't see these snowballs at the top of the mountain. So for all intents and purposes, they might as well not even exist. So we had to completely rethink the way that we defined an endpoint and, and where we even measure these endpoints in the first place. And for us at Functional Fluidics, we had to think about how do we develop bioassays that can help us understand the biology of the snowball and not just predict the oncoming of an, of an avalanche. So in the age of smartphones and Fitbits and all the technology that Daniel's gonna tell you about later on, um, <laughs> We partnered with, uh, with Pfizer and the Children's Hospital of Michigan to conduct the first longitudinal study to define both the biology and the experience of patients with sickle cell disease. Um, and we did this in their homes and not in the hospital environment. So the, the participants in this study recorded their daily experience of pain and fatigue and, and quality of life measures using a patient reported outcome tool. Um, and this was based on a smartphone smartphone platform that most of our patients were very comfortable using. We also use an actigraphy monitor, which think of it as a Fitbit, which would measure their, their movement and activity as a surrogate for pain and fatigue. Um, we also use mobile phlebotomists to obtain serial blood samples in the patient's home, and we correlated this data with the daily experience of these patients and, and understood how that related to the cellular biology. So using these tools, we're able to objectively quantify and describe the pre-hospital experience of patients with sickle cell disease. And with this insight, I hope that we can spend more time fielding snowballs at the top of the mountain and, as opposed to managing and digging out of, of avalanches. So think of it as health maintenance as opposed to crises management. Although I use sickle cell as a specific example, I could use a number of examples that I see in the ICU and that many of you probably see yourselves, like the asthma that comes into the ICU that should never make it there, uh, the mental health issues that bring uh, kids into the ICU. Um, many of these issues that, where the determinants of outcome are based on issues that happen at home far away from the healthcare environment. So I'm gonna close with saying, as, as, as an intensivist who is the medical equivalent of an avalanche rescue worker, um, can find a place in figuring out what issues these patients are dealing with at home, outside of the healthcare environment, I think that there's hope for us all. In 1965, Dr. Jack Geiger founded one of the first community health centers in the United States in a desperately poor area of the Mississippi Delta called Mound Bayou. And so many of the patients that he saw at this health center presented with malnutrition that he began writing prescriptions for food. And patients would take these prescriptions for milk and meat, for fruits and vegetables, to the local supermarket, which would fill the prescriptions and then charge the pharmacy budget of the clinic. And when the Office of Economic Opportunity in Washington, D.C. found out about this, they were furious. <laughs> and they sent down a bureaucrat to set Dr. Geiger straight and to tell him that they had intended their dollars to be used for medical care. To which Dr. Geiger, by his own account, famously responded, the last time I checked my textbooks, the specific therapy for malnutrition was food. <laughs> but in September 1995, 30 years later, I walked into the chaotic lobby of Boston City Hospital. 
And I spent the next six months having conversations with physicians and nurses in which they shared the same story again and again. They would say, every day we have patients that come into the clinic and the child presents with an asthma exacerbation. We prescribe controller medication, but we know that the real issue is that this child is living with 12 other people in a dilapidated brownstone with asbestos and mildew, and we don't ask about those issues because there's nothing we can do. They said, you know, we have 13 minutes with each patient. We have patients that are piling up in the clinic waiting room. We have no idea where the nearest food pantry is or how to get this patient into different housing. We weren't trained to deal with this stuff in medical school. And we have two social workers for 24,000 pediatric patients. So it seems that it shouldn't be so difficult to design a doctor's visit or even our healthcare system around what patients need to be healthy. But we have not done that. <laughs> And I have had hundreds, and honestly at this point probably thousands of conversations with physicians, nurses, health systems executives, CEOs of major insurers, in which they say when it comes to our patients' basic resource needs, we practice a don't ask, don't tell policy. And my work with health leads was born of these conversations and the simple premise that a physician like Patrick should be able to prescribe food or heat for a patient if that's what the patient needs in order to be healthy. So fast forward another 20 years, and where are we today? So it is well established that just 10% of health outcomes are tied to medical care. 70% are attributable to social and environmental factors and the behaviors that are so associated with those. In other words, everything that happens for the vast majority of time, the patients are not in the clinic or the hospital. And yet the truth is we still have not even begun to design our healthcare system around this reality. We talk about managing the health of populations and we ignore 70% of what actually drives population health. Which begs the question, the one that I'm most obsessed with, which is why don't we do what we need to do to deliver health in this country? And as we witness these legislative brawls in Washington, D.C. over the future of health care, it calls another question, which is have we simply forgotten that delivering health is the purpose of the enterprise in the first place? In April 1963, Martin Luther King wrote the letter from Birmingham jail. This was a letter that he wrote in response to a letter that eight white clergy had written to him, telling him to call off the desegregation demonstrations in Birmingham. They said to him, justice will come, be patient, chill out. <laughs> and King replied to this. He said, we will repent in this generation, not for the vitriolic words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good. It's like he was speaking to us today. Because in healthcare now, there is so much noise, right? We hear fights over coverage expansion, work requirements, block grants, drug prices, insurance regulations, everything that we've been talking about for the past three days. But when it comes to this basic question of whether we have a healthcare system that is fundamentally designed to deliver health, I hear a few voices, but mostly silence. Is healthcare really just about reduced ER visits, 30-day readmissions, ICD-10 codes, survival under a litany of payment models? Is that the endeavor? My strong hunch is that these are not the issues that Americans care about. And for those of us who have chosen to, gone into, to go into healthcare, this is not what inspired us to do so. The question is, where is our voice? And where is your voice silent? What are we not saying? And it comes to a basic question of what is this project of healthcare really about? In healthcare, we talk a lot about the triple aim, these three co-equal pillars of better health, reduced cost, and improved care. But in practice, we allow health to languish, value not as a primary animating force of the enterprise, but rather only as a means to the end of cost and care, as opposed to, more logically, the other way around. We promise a patient-centered, equitable healthcare system. We hear about this all the time. And yet, our patients in this country have never before been more vulnerable. Anna Roth, who's the CEO of Contra Costa Regional Medical Center in Northern California, says, now every provider is a safety net provider. So a year ago, 
We had a patient in one of our partner clinics uh, who came in. This is a large academic medical center in Baltimore. I'll let you figure out which one it was. <laughs> so this adolescent patient comes into the clinic. He's been losing weight. He's been losing weight. He's been losing weight. And the doctors are frustrated. They huddle up and they start talking about which blood tests and which metabolic panels they're going to run. And one of our health leads trained advocates happens to be standing nearby and says, do you think he might be hungry? And literally, the doctors are incredulous, right? They say, hungry? He didn't say anything about being hungry. But you can ask him if you want. So of course, this patient had been kicked out of his housing several weeks prior and literally just hadn't eaten for weeks. And he said he was so relieved that someone finally asked me. So the question is, how, is we have, how have we created a healthcare system in which it is so outside the bounds of that system to ask somebody whether they are hungry that we forget or fail to do so in the first place? How have we created a healthcare system where we are asked to justify the return on investment of screening patients for food insecurity, but we never ask the question whether ordering metabolic panels and blood tests wastes our healthcare dollars? How do we have a healthcare system where the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the largest purchaser of healthcare in the world, can launch a $157 million pilot that randomizes hungry patients into an intervention and non-intervention control group? That is, some hungry patients get food and some get information about food with the ethical justification that standard and usual practice in our healthcare system is to do nothing for patients who are hungry. In his letter, King wrote, in the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard many ministers say, those are social issues which the gospel has nothing to do with. So we hear a lot of talk these days about social determinants of health, but if we are honest, how often have we heard this in healthcare? Those are social issues which healthcare has nothing to do with. How complicated would it be to add a few questions to every patient intake about food or housing? To use every phone call that a member makes to an insurance provider about coverage or a bill? To ask that patient whether she's choosing between paying for her medication and paying for her heat at the end of the month? To maintain a registry of food insecure patients the same way we maintain registries of patients with heart disease? to deploy our hospital discharge planners, not just to connect patients to a primary care doctor, but to connect them to job training. To call these questions and to answer them, we do not have to be Martin Luther King, but we do need to break the silence. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daniel Kraft. I'm a physician scientist trained in internal medicine, pediatrics, and hematology, oncology, and lucky to be an Aspen Health Innovator Fellow. But I spend part of my time uh, chairing medicine for a nine-year-old organization called Singularity University and run a program called Exponential Medicine where we look at where all these incredible technologies that are exploding today can play a role in everything from mental health to curing sickle cell disease to uh, impacting social determinants of health. So I want to give a quick snippet and, and hopefully shift your mindset about what's here today and what's coming across a few spectrums. First, um, um, where we are with um, health and prevention, uh, diagnostics, therapy, and how we can all maybe even play a role in reshaping healthcare in, in clinical trials and discovery. So first of all, as I think as we've already heard this morning, um, we don't have a healthcare system today, especially in the US, we have a sick care system. We spend most of our healthcare dollars on folks who already have disease. Um, we have very intermittent data, occasional blood pressure checks, uh, sickle cell screens, uh, elements that might pick up mental health issues only when folks get admitted to the, uh, uh, to the ER. Um, so we're very reactive. We wait for the heart attack or the stroke, or in my field of oncology, the cancer to pre present at stage three or stage four. And I think the hope of leveraging these new technologies and mindsets is to be more continuous with our data and then much more proactive and uh, really shift the equation again from healthcare, uh, from sick care to healthcare. So a, a bit of framing, you know, we're only in, we're in 2017 today. It wasn't even 10 years ago that the uh, first smartphone came out. I have an antique iPhone 2 in my pocket. And imagine how fast the world's changed just in the last 10 years. This is an exponential technology. They keep getting, you know, twice as fast and more powerful uh, and sometimes less expensive every two years or so. And 
10 years ago, these were amazing. If you had to go back and use my iPhone 2, it would feel slow and clunky, has a low resolution camera. Now we're at the iPhone what, 7. Imagine what the iPhone you know, 10 or 11 or 12 might be. It might be in four dimensions. But uh, literally, these are exploding and shifting how we practice health and medicine and many other elements of our lives. And they're just one example of exponential technologies. We have um, 3D printing and AI and robotics and nanotech all converging and sometimes getting cheaper and more available with an opportunity to bring them together to address some of the grand challenges we have in healthcare, whether it's aging populations, access to care, um, what do we do with all the big data, whether from our, our genomics or our scattered systems where we're still using fa fax machines in many of our hospitals and clinics to communicate. How do we help our friends at the FDA, the F word, uh, get out of their linear mindset? Um, or our friends, the payers, reward, uh, whether it's a, a new uh, drug, device, application, or social program. So lots of challenges and lots of opportunities. Let's look at a few in, in real briefly. First of all, um, health and prevention. Um, we know that our genetics are important, but it's our behaviors that impact most of our long-term costs. We're now just in the age of, of wearables. Fitbits have only been around, what, uh, six, seven years. Who's wearing one today? You know, some of you have, who's got one in their drawer that they put and they lost it? I've got four different versions on, including a, a ring that can track my sleep, something I'm deprived on at the moment. Um, so we have all these new ways to measure our behaviors. And we're going well beyond the idea of just wearables on our wrists and our, our fingers. We're going to the idea of incitables, contact lenses that can track our blood sugars, uh, devices underneath our skin that can transmit our, our blood sugars and potassiums. We're going to the idea of trainables, little devices on our back that might help uh, buzz our back and improve our posture, one of the huge causes of uh, uh, primary care visits. Uh, we're moving to um, hearables. Our hearing aids or our uh, music devices can track our steps and our heart rates and tune our, our activity. Lots of things are exploding in the wearable and connected health world. We're actually moving from internet of things to internet of medical things. We're gonna be in the 5G world soon in a few years. So, Almost all our, our, our devices, our homes, our, our wearables can start to measure our behaviors and hopefully then start to nudge us in smart behaviors uh, that will end up uh, preventing heart disease, cancer, and beyond. So that's just a, a small taste. Uh, even on the, on the mental health side of the equation, our, our voice can be picked up from our smartphones. Uh, our behaviors, our texting, our movement can be on platforms which can then enable us to be more proactive, to give us touch points uh, in our normal environment to be proactive. So lots of opportunity to improve the, the health without waiting for the sickness side of the equation. What about on the diagnostic side? Uh, we often, again, have very small amounts of data. We're hopefully only in a clinical setting point, 0.0001% of our lifetime. Now we're in the age of uh, di digital diagnostics. You can have a smartphone attachment on your phone that can look in your kid's ear, send it to the pediatrician. Is he or she incentivized to prescribe a digital otoscope? Are they gonna get reimbursed for that? Uh, lots of barriers and misaligned incentives. But we have a whole new set of digital diagnostics. You know, a few in my pocket, I'm gonna pull them all out. Uh, <laughs> Even for someone with um, atrial fibrillation, a little device that can go on your smartphone, uh, track your EKG, tell you if you have atrial fibrillation. Even Apple Watches now are able to diagnose uh, atrial fib. So we have new tools that can be in the pockets, can lower the cost of diagnostics, and can be used to triage and be proactive. And democratize this. I've been involved in helping design the medical tricorder exercise. Several hundred teams developed devices inspired by Star Trek that you could have as a consumer at home to pull down your temperature, your heart rate, your oxygen saturation, talk to your smartphone, embed it with artificial intelligence to make sense of your data and hopefully transmit that uh, forward when you um, have an issue. Or ways, for example, to uh, determine if you have a, a avian flu or, or something else. Spit in here, take a picture with your smartphone, that's transmitted to your doctor, to the CDC, to the NSA, whoever else wants the information. Um, and it again enables us to pick up information in smart ways um, before you end up in the ER intensive care unit and beyond. So we have a whole new world and lots of exponential data, data coming at us. We're now at the $1,000 genome, soon to be a $500 genome. Uh, we have not just uh, genomics, but um, our microbiome data, our proteome, our exposome, where we lived. If we grew up in Aspen or in Beijing, very different uh, uh, health risk factors. So we need things like artificial intelligence. I was on a panel here the other day with the head of IBM Watson Health to start to make sense of this exponential amount of data. No physician or patient or, or health administrator can integrate this and make sense of it in a proactive way. So we need new tools, not artificial intelligence, but intelligence augmentation across the whole spectrum. It may be malpractice in 10 years not to use AI to do the smart workup or prescribe the right uh, therapeutic, whether it's an app, a social uh, element, or just a smart diet. So finally, what about therapeutics? We're moving well beyond just drugs and devices. We're in the era of prescribing apps. Uh, some are for mental health, some are to manage sickle cell patients, some are to uh, connect you with your clinician. The age of telehealth is here. Today you can talk to a doctor or a nurse on your, on your phone student, may your, be your physician. It'll be augmented with tools like 
augmented reality, another element that's, that's converging. This is an antique uh, you know, Google Glass, but these can be used to augment uh, clinical visits or enable you in this new era of, of uh, uh, AR and VR to interact with your own health information, re-educate patients and clinicians across the spectrum. Finally, and, and, and also we're moving quickly into worlds like CRISPR, gene therapy is uh, coming, so we'll soon take sickle cell patients like we heard about and take out some of their bone marrow, I'm a bone marrow transplant doctor, replace that bad gene, retransplant them and cure them. That's already happened in clinical trials this year, so huge things are coming. Finally, discovery. How do we all start to impact the future of medicine, whether you're a doctor, patient, or caregiver? We're now in an era of crowdsourcing. 10 years ago, we all still dro drove with paper maps. Now, you couldn't imagine driving without Google Maps or Waze. We're crowdsourcing our driving. We share private data, our speed and location. We get a map of the traffic and where the cops are, and we get information back. What if we brought that same crowdsourcing element to healthcare? Well, we're not just blood and organ donors, but data donors. And we build those healthcare maps of the future, kind of like a GPS for healthcare. Daniel, go right to the gym not left to the fast food restaurant, or if I have diabetes, to manage that in smart ways and connect us to our AI digital coaches that can nudge us to keep us healthy rather than waiting for disease to happen. So tremendous opportunities. I hope you all start to think a bit exponentially. The future is coming faster than you think. Think about the overlap of all these amazing technologies that can address some of these problems and lower the costs and bring us true healthcare. Move us from intermittent reactive sick care to continuous and proactive healthcare. So we all need to become exponential thinkers and we all need to not just predict the future but go out there and boldly create it together. So thanks. Right, so now you've heard from them. Um, I know I've been in uh, health policy for about 30 years now. Um, yeah, I started when I was 12 years old. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I have to say that every single day, my uh, health fellows, uh, these and some who are out in the audience and others, we now have 40 of them, make me think and question, what have I been doing all these years? And what kind of impact am I gonna have? So I wanna hear from you all. What, what, uh, what made you think of this? And please, oh, yes. Just a quick announcement. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, we, have, we don't have a mic stand, but if you could come to the mic, we have a human mic stand. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> David, and please tell us who you are. Uh, thank you all very much. My name is David Rosenthal. Um, I'm a primary care physician. I run a homeless clinic for the VA in Connecticut. Um, and I used to be a health IT person as well. Um, thank you all. This, I mean, the four presentations were amazing. All of you are just incredibly inspiring. And thank you for coming here and sharing with all of us. I think all of us are going to leave here with a lot of thoughts and questions. Um, I have one comment, one question. Um, the comment is that um, after hearing the four of you together in this panel, it makes me um, reflect on how there are two worlds we live in. Um, and both amazing, amazing progress technologically uh, and in a society where I think we all reflect that there is just incredible injustice and, and um, uh, lack of equity. Um, and so my question is, how do we bridge those divides such that we make sure that, that the future is already here but it's just unequally distributed, but how do we redistribute it? Or how do we make sure that the progress gains that we're getting elsewhere are rising all the boats for everyone. Thanks. That's a great question. Who'd like to? I'll take one quick piece of that. Is that, um, you know, I come from Silicon Valley, and sometimes we assume everyone's got their Google Glass and their Apple Watch on, and that's how we cure things in, in San Francisco. But we can democratize some of these elements of healthcare. You know, we're now in an era of, you know, $35 smart tablets that used to be uh, $6,000. And, and uh, while the prescription for uh, folks with uh, low socioeconomic status or living in um, parts of rural America or Africa isn't to prescribe them a device or an app, we can distribute and democratize some of these technologies to give folks um, ownership of their own health data, to connect to care, whether it's through a chatbot or to get drone, drone delivery if you need it in a remote location. So while some things are fancy and high tech, it can actually be distributed and democratize things in smart ways uh, to give access to care where folks don't have it. I'll say an another um, issue is, is just education in general. So I, I, um, my company's based in Detroit and um, there's a, in the incubation center where we work, there's a company called Ecotech that basically focuses on um, giving access to young inner city kids in the city to uh, STEM uh, education and opportunities to learn about it. And you'll be uh, amazed at the type of projects these kids can do if given the opportunity to learn about it. So I think a lot of these things can be accessible 
to folks that you wouldn't necessarily think if, if they're given access and, uh, and, and the ability to do that. And it takes uh, folks like us to, to provide those opportunities. But if given the opportunities, they can ex uh, access and use these technologies as well as anybody else. Um, so as an undergraduate, I was a history and science major. And one of the most kind of profound parts of that um, education was this recognition that you know science is a is a neutral right it's neither good nor evil it's just a choice of how we use it and I think that we have some real work to do as a country about deciding what we're committed to and who we're committed to and until we're really clear on um, what the project of the healthcare system is, and more profoundly, what our commitment is as to the use of 19% of our GDP. We create enormous risk that science will, um, will not be fully used for good. And so, you know, the question that I'm most interested in is how we begin to have a more honest and more complete set of conversations as a country about the fundamental nature of the endeavor, as I was saying before, and the equity of that endeavor relative to those who experience it. Hi, Steve Downs with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And um, I, I was really interested in this panel because I know both Rebecca and Daniel Kraft, and I was trying to imagine a panel that had the two of them <laughs> on it. Uh, uh, but this was outstanding, and, and I, I really- I wanted to come and see it go down. I just wanted to see it happen, that's it. Um, and you did not disappoint. Um, but but I, I, uh, I wanna make a serious point, and, 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 and Rebecca, in effect, you just made it, uh, which is what I heard from both you, Patrick, and, and Daniel, is the tremendous opportunity and the change in the resources that we'll be able to bring to bear in, in the whole endeavor. Um, but without, I think, what, what Shannon and Rebecca have talked about, about really focusing on, on the goals and the purposes of the system, we could go down a path of just much more expensive, more sophisticated care, more downstream uh, activity. Um, and we absolutely need to have the conversation uh, that I think this is pointing us towards. So thank you all very much. And can I just say one thing, uh, Steve? I, I think you know, this point is such an important one. And you know, not to be lost here is actually like this is the value of the fellowship, right? Is the notion of bringing together, a, I am passionate about the, the Health Innovators Fellowship. And you know, to me, and, and many of our fellow fellows are here in the room, to me the power of the fellowship is bringing together values-based leaders who express those values through you know, every facet of healthcare broadly defined and i think that's one of the real challenges right now is actually that like how do we how do we embark on the next um the next several decades of healthcare that actually compel Daniel and me to be in a conversation together, right? And like those contexts are shockingly hard to come by, which is part of the power of the fellowship in the first place, right? And, um, and I think part of the intention we need to bring to it is how do we actually create contexts in which we have these conversations? I think one of the things, I don't wanna speak for all the fellows, one of the things we've learned is how profoundly we share a set of values and how important it is to understand deeply what those mean for each of us, but also to be in conversation with each other about how those get expressed across the entirety of what we mean by health and healthcare. To that point, a lot of healthcare is so siloed. I mean, it's, it's cardiology or, or hematology or social uh, or mental health and um, the power of the fellowship as well as we unsilo our different spectrums and see how they blend together. So, you know, one area that's moving quickly is like big data and, and mapping and crowdsourcing. You can now map um, hotspots of uh, food deserts in inner city and provide, again, proactive elements before someone goes hungry. Or for mental health, uh, provide, uh, you know, a simple chatbot on your smartphone that can give uh, access to a real doctor or an AI one for, for, for support, which shows clinical output. So these things aren't um, necessarily segmented. We can overlap them. Please. Hi, my name is Lee Caswell. I'm with a nonprofit health system in New Mexico and also really blessed to be a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health leader where we're getting to really have similar conversations. And I really want to thank you all and especially Rebecca because you've really inspired us for many years in this work and you have, I just want to thank you for taking the lead. And my question is really, 
you know, we are an accountable health community awardee, mm -hmm. and we have a pathways model in our state, and we are really trying to do this work. And I'm really struggled with the ethics of screening and referring for housing and these things that we know that are, there aren't enough of them. And then we have this really challenging financial environment, especially in our state, but I think across the country. And I just, I would appreciate your advice on what is our role in healthcare in investing with that and dealing with that tension that the services just don't exist and we can't carry it all. So this is, so the Accountable Health Communities pilot that, um, tell me your name again. Lee Caswell. That Lee just spoke about is the CMS pilot that I mentioned that's randomizing patients basically about whether or not they get their social needs met. Um, so uh, we believe fervently <laughs> that it is the role and responsibility of the healthcare system um, to, um, to track that data, to collect that data, even if it is not actionable. And part of the reason, you know, so, so the, the challenge here is, as you all know, there is no affordable housing in any community in the United States. And so as healthcare providers, you know, folks really struggle with, Patrick and I were just having this conversation, you know, how do you ask about something that you can't do something about? And you know, our real kind of belief and work at Health Leads is the notion of using healthcare as a Trojan horse to be able to get at how we choose to spend our dollars in this country and what we choose to invest in. And if the healthcare system collects data showing that its unhoused patients have, are more expensive, have worse health outcomes, are more likely to get admitted to the hospital, are more likely to show up in the ER, I will tell you that is infinitely more powerful than any affordable housing group making the same point. And you know, the, the role of responsibility in healthcare is not to address every issue, but it is to um, assume responsibility for understanding the drivers of its patients' health and ensuring that that there is full responsibility relative to the leadership that's associated with calling those questions. So, you know, one of the interesting experiences we had when we launched in Northern California was that in one of the clinics where we launched, 60% of the patients were running out of food at the end of the month, but 40% of the CalFresh, the food stamps benefits in California, go unclaimed. I will tell you that when the head of government affairs at Kaiser Permanente decided to become involved in why it was so challenging for people to access food stamps benefits in California, that was reams more effective than any you know, organization like Health Leads advocating for improved access to, um, to food or housing. And I think that's the real opportunity for our healthcare system. Okay, we have time for just one more question, Joanne. And, and I um, run the healthcare coverage at Politico, and in addition to our millimeter by millimeter coverage of what goes on in Congress, <laughs> we're doing our magazine Free Outside of Paywall has been doing a year-long series on public health in the 21st century, public health really broadly defined. Our first edition featured a piece on health leads. I just assigned a piece on um, behavioral and physical health. Patrick, you gave me an idea for, Oct for November. You may hear from me later. <laughs> but, I, but we've done a ton on e-health, and my question is really for Daniel, because I, I see this explosion. I see like a gazillion times 20 apps and tools, and I've seen some of them work on small pilots. But I don't know which ones are good, and I don't know which ones help patients. And I, and I hear from doctors, leave me alone. I have more data than I know what to do with. I cannot deal with all this patient-generated stuff. So how do we figure out, how do we find the gems that we can use in this, you know, um, you don't know what my inbox looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. We are living in this, you know, this bit of a buzzword of, of digital health and connected health and mobile health. Um, but one of the opportunities is to align the incentives. We're now in this year of, you know, a lot of us are data geeks. We wear our connected devices. We can track our steps and our sleep. That's quantified self. But that can move to quantified health, where every patient, whether they have sickle cell or a mental health issue or diabetes, their data from their wearables and low-cost ones can connect into their EMR. And their you know, poor, overwhelmed physician has to have that part of their workflow. No one wants to see my individual raw data, it needs to be synthesized and integrated and presented so that we're proactive. Imagine each of you have your own GPS, or sorry, your own health uh, check engine light for the body, and your physician who has 2,000 patients gets, uh, uh, and you as an individual see that check engine light, uh, and you, you, the physician calls you or your, or your nurse does proactively. So while there's a lot of froth in digital health and a lot of apps are, are not very good, we're seeing the FDA and others 
and at Stanford we have a digital health program starting to show that if you give someone a connected blood pressure cuff and can, that data can flow to their clinician or their blood sugar, they can de definitively improve hypertension and blood sugar control. So there's early evidence that quote unquote digital health can work in the right hands um, and we need to connect the dots and make it part of not just the triple aim, the quadruple aim to leverage these technologies to make uh, the, the uh, situation for the clinician who's overwhelmed by some of this data and inbox smarter as well. I think Shannon wants to say something. Just to add on to that really quick. So uh, suicide rate is extremely high after an ER visit, upwards of 30 to 40%. And a lot of times it's because there is not connection after discharge from an ER if they haven't moved on to an inpatient unit. Uh, so there was this company, and I have no idea who they are, but they created like a little alien device, and the patient took it home with them. And then when they woke up in the morning, it would say, how are you doing today? And they would say, I'm just fine. And it would know by the inflection of your voice whether you're fine or not fine. But it wasn't, that wasn't the point at all. It was the patient said that it was valuable because they knew the message was being sent back to the doctor. So is the ability or the feeling of connection to the physician that mattered and actually encouraged um, them to take responsibility for their care. But I think that we could change that. So we right now at NAMI and my new company is Ballast Health, we connect with ER through the family peer voice. So we could do that same model. So when you're discharged from an ER, the family members or peer people with a mental illness, they can be the ones that are making that follow up connection via some sort of technology to do that coaching support. And the last thing I add on is that we really have to study these things. Like we talked about Fitbits and actigraphy and, and how we're sort of applying it to this study with sickle cell disease. I mean, people think, oh, wow, that's really cool. I mean, you could really follow what patients are doing, but you don't know what that data means unless you really correlate it with um, folks who really understand what's happening with the patient and associate that with what this technology, this wearable is actually giving you. So I think people have to collaborate more with these guys and, and figure out what exactly it means and, and validate it. All right, I'm so sorry. I know we, there are lots more questions and comments. These folks will be around for a while. You'll see them over the next day or two. And I wanna thank you so much for um, your attention and great questions and especially thanks to these four folks.